get into Matthew chapter 3 here. And uh, as we look at this, I want us to see some of the changes that happen here as we transition over to another chapter. But uh, before I get into everything, and, uh, we start into John the Baptist, which we're going to look at now extensively for a few messages. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we want to come before you and <clears throat> praise you for all that you provided for us. We praise you for the privilege of worshiping you. We praise you for the privilege of reading and understanding your word. And we just praise you and thank you for the fellowship that you've given us, that other brothers and sisters in Christ are around us and uh, encourage and support us and keep us going. And uh, we thank you that even in the midst of that, uh, regardless of uh, people around us, uh, may or may not fail us, that you alone will be steadfast and faithful to preserve us to be in And Lord, I pray as we look now at your word and your gospel, as you present it through your son, that we would be a people mindful of our hearts, of how we need to conform ourselves to your nature and to your purpose. And I pray that you would enable me to speak words of truth that come from your word, that you would be with me and what I say, and that you would be with each one of us and our hearts and our ears and allow us to truly understand what you have written for us. All right, so Matthew chapter 3, where we're going to start in now, uh, we finished up the birth narrative, uh, the nativity narrative, where uh, we looked at essentially all that's going on with all these uh, key prophetic passages that are involved in um, the discussion of the birth of Christ, right? So we looked at, there's at least five, there's half a dozen Old Testament prophecies that show up in chapters 1 and 2 that over and over make the point that Christ is validated, that Christ is the authentic message, that he is who he says he is. Uh, Jeremiah says who he is. Isaiah says who he is. Hosea says who he is. All of these prophets across this wide spectrum of eras and time and circumstances and uh, voices have all come together to speak the same message, that this child born in the first chapters of Matthew is the authentic real deal. He is the Messiah. He is the one that they're looking for. And, uh, that's essentially what we looked at so far. We looked at uh, the story of Herod specifically last week. Uh, we looked at the Magi. We looked at the star of Bethlehem that these uh, uh, apparently on some level pagan astrologers understood the significance of what had just happened by means of divine revelation and how they are set up as this uh, direct opposite to Herod and to the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish scholars and kings which should know about the Messiah. They should be the first people to run and worship Christ. And it is instead these Gentile pagans that travel great distances and sacrifice immense effort to go and worship Christ. And uh, we looked specifically last week at Herod and uh, the not necessarily likable idea, but the prominent scriptural idea that God absolutely foreordains and predestines evil and horrible events to bring about his gospel and his glory and the glory of his name. And uh, even in the case of Herod, and we see that because there's, proph there's prophetic utterance that makes clear that this was the plan all along. From, uh, from the original passage, it's quoted in Matthew 2, 18, that there was a voice heard in Ramah. This was always the plan, that Herod would come and bring about this destruction in Bethlehem of human life and uh, to that end of that he would validate and authenticate the message and the person of Christ that was always the plan that these children would die for that reason and that's not a likable message that's not a happy message but there is in the midst of that a comforting message to know that even in the midst of trial and suffering and pain and difficulty that there is a reason for it and God has a plan and he knows what he's doing in the midst of the plan and uh, that's something that we can take to heart. We can remember even when something is horrifying as uh, the destruction of human life on such a massive scale is imminent in our culture or elsewhere. And uh, now we get to chapter 3. So we're going to start in a uh, transition completely to some new things here. We're looking specifically at John the Baptist. We're going to be dealing with John the Baptist for several messages. Uh, he's obviously the prominent figure in chapter 3. And uh, all that he goes into, and John the Baptist has a very specific message for a specific time. Uh, but he is here to preach to us and make clear to us what we need to do in light of Christ's revelation. Right? That's what he has to say. So we get to chapter 3. This begins this new section. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. 
Um, we might get through three or four verses here, but uh, this is essentially how this opens, right? So you see John the Baptist here. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this was he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him to be baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, as we go on through this passage, we're going to see that he gets involved in this dialogue and this confrontation with what eventually becomes the Pharisees. But uh, here, just in the first six verses, we can note a few things automatically just by looking at the person and description of John. Okay, So there's four things that we can note immediately about John. And the first one is John's purpose, John's mission, right? That is stated immediately up front in verse 2. So he's here to come preach. And what is he here to preach? He's here to preach repentance because the kingdom's at hand. That's John's purpose. That's all he is here to do. We know, in hindsight, we understand that he was designed to do that and he was foreordained to bring this about because of who would come after him. He is here to prepare the hearts and the minds of the people that will eventually come and hear Christ. So his purpose here is to preach repentance, right? He is the forerunner of Christ in this regard. Christ has not come on the scene yet. He's about to come on the scene. But before that happens, people need repentance. That's a fascinating concept that we need to take to heart. Uh, so we see here that John's mission and his purpose is the preaching of repentance, okay? The first thing that we can note immediately out of the text. The second thing is that we see he's prophetically validated, right? There's, immediate prop there's a prophetic statement, uh, specifically from Isaiah 40, which uh, we may look at here if we have time at the end of the day. Um, if not, we'll look at it next week. But there's a statement from Isaiah 40, right? This idea of... He is the one, the voice that cries in the wilderness, make the path straight, right? So here Matthew once again is returning to this Old Testament pattern in which he shows you that this was always the plan, that John the Baptist was always going to come and he was going to make way the way of the Lord. He's going to make it straight. He's going to grade out the roads so that everything is straight and flattened out and prepare the way for Christ to come on them. So uh, you see that he's prophetically validated, right? So you have first his purpose and his message. And secondly, you have the fact that he is validated from the Old Testament, that he is the real deal. And then, thirdly, we see immediately John's destitution, right? He's poor. He's, no, he's not rich. He's not famous. He's not big in any human standard by any method or methodology. He's not a tradesman by any means. If you look at other prophets in Scripture, even the vast majority of the prophets had some measure or level of previous occupation or trade. Isaiah was a shepherd. And uh, you look at all, a lot of these examples, but John specifically is listed as essentially, by human standards, what would be a madman. He lives out in the desert. He eats bugs and honey. He makes claws out of hair that he finds, and he preaches repentance. By all modern standards, we would think that's insanity. If you uh, walk down the street and you saw somebody like that, you think they're out of their mind. But that's fascinating. And we looked at that uh, specifically, and it, it, it's interesting that he notes the wild honey. Here, that he scavenges for bugs and wild honey, and there's uh, people that do, just as a side note, there's people that do the fascinating studies on uh, these items that appear, these various uh, patterns that appear throughout Scripture on little things like honey, and uh, how early on in Exodus it's described as a positive benefit, right? We want to go to the land of flowing of milk and honey, right? It's a paradise. There's lots of honey there and milk, so we're going to go there and live. And then as Scripture progresses, it actually changes a little bit and it becomes more of a, a destitution symbol, right? We looked at uh, Isaiah 7, this idea that <clears throat> the child that will be born that has locusts and wild honey, it's scavenger food, right? When the kings come in and they raid your land, it's all that's left. You don't have any livestock, you don't have anything in the fields, you don't have anything else, so all you can do is just kind of scavenge around the countryside until you find some honey. And uh, it's the same thing here, right? John doesn't buy food, he just finds what he can find. And it's fascinating because it mentions the fact that by all human standards, we would write this individual off, that society would write this individual off as an insane individual. But that's interesting in light of the fourth thing that we note here is that John is massively popular in terms of people coming out and seeing him. It says Jerusalem and Judea and all the region of Jordan were coming out to see this guy. They wanted to invest in this guy. But in spite of his crazy lifestyle, in spite of his seeming insanity by human standards, 
people in the Jewish time and era of this point realized that he was important. They got something. They realized that this man screaming repentance out in the desert was significant. He was not just crazy. And that's fascinating to realize as we go further into this message. And you also have to realize John did not preach a popular message. He was not here to preach the prosperity gospel. He was not here to preach health and wealth. People might journey into the desert for that. But people came out in the vast majorities to come see a man screech repentance at them from a river. That's fascinating. Why would they do that? And I'm going to look at all this in detail, but uh, for now, what I really want to focus on today is the message of John. So, essentially the thesis that I want to lay out for the first two verses is this, is that Christ makes it clear, God makes it clear to the first couple verses of this chapter that no one can come to Christ without repentance. And repentance has to be a defining characteristic of the believer's life. It has to be something that we are constantly and regularly and consistently abiding in. It is something that defines us as human beings, not just at the initial salvation, but throughout our lives, we have to be a repentant people. Repentance has to be the first step. It is such a preliminary and foundational step that an entire individual prophet was sent for the purpose of making sure people understood the significance of it before Christ even comes and sacrifices himself. So repentance is a massive deal for those that believe and trust in the person of Christ. That just as the people of John the Baptist that go out to see him had to understand sin and they had to understand confession, they had to understand repentance before Christ's message could come, we have to realize that it is a defining characteristic of those that claim to be saved by Christ. Repentance. So in the coming passages, we're going to look at the message of John. We're going to get eventually, I'm hoping in a couple weeks to get to his confrontation and his dialogue with the Pharisees, which is inevitable. Uh, but in these opening verses, we see the purpose and the message of John, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is in hand. Before I get into the uh, exact specifics of the exegesis here, I want us to kind of zoom out a little bit and just note how significant this is, because if you look at uh, the vast, all the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, John is the most consistent story that you'll see in every single Gospel account. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every one of them has something to say about John the Baptist, and it's almost incredibly consistent. There's guys that do these studies, and they sit down, and they say, well, how consistent are all the Gospels? And uh, uh, how, how much of the same material and the same wording and the same stories and the same passages come across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And how much is there diversity among them? How much is there similarity among them? And I think, I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere around, it's actually pretty low, but you would think it's about 30 to 40 percent consistency because each Gospel writer is inspired to write, write down something different in some terms. Right, there's a diversity of understanding about all the works of Christ, right? Uh, there's specifically, what's interesting is that John, the Gospel of John, not John the Baptist, the Gospel of John is kind of this outlier. Uh, he's so incredibly different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in terms of uh, what they call it, that uh, all these scholars call it the synoptic Gospels. They say the synoptic Gospels are Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke because they're fairly similar, and John just does his own thing. John's out here in left field. Uh, he writes it according to his understanding and what he remembers and what he understands. But in light of that, it's amazing that there's such consistency about John the Baptist throughout all four Gospels. All of them are so similar. And if you look at all the stories across John the Baptist, across all four Gospels, you'll note that there are some consistencies, not only in the fact that he's there, that they did remember him, every one of them, and the fact that they did write out exactly what his events were, but all of them remember distinctly a few facts, and the first one is that he's not supposed to be the main player, right? He's not the main event. He is the forerunner to the main event, and that's made very clear in all the Gospels. So he is not supposed to be the main event. He's only here to draw attention to the main event. And in all, in both, all four Gospels, you'll see again that he is two things. He is a preacher of repentance, right? And he was also, obviously, a baptizer. So he does two actions consistently across all four Gospels. I'm going to look now at one of them. I'm going to look at Luke's account of John the Baptist. And I'm hoping that as we look at the broader view of John the Baptist across all four Gospels, that that will bear us through as we get into some more nitty-gritty details. And uh, so I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. You'll see a lot of the characteristics of Luke come out in the same dialogue and in the same passage here. So, as is uh, stylistic of Luke, he records all these details up at the front. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, 
Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip being the Tetrarch of the region of, the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias being the Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, there's John's message, consistently. And as, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall be made low, the crooked shall become straight, the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And then you'll even know that this dialogue is consistent across Luke and Matthew. It says, therefore, the crowds came out to be baptized to him, and this is what he said, you brood of vipers. It's the first thing, popular message that he's got to say, for those that come out to hear him, calls them snakes. You warn, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The exact same wording that you'll find in Matthew chapter 3, including the prophetic quote from Isaiah 40, including uh, his initial statement, although in Matthew, it's this brood of vipers statement is directed to the Pharisees, and here it's directed to the entirety of the crowd at large. Uh, clearly, this was a very common message for John. This is something that both Pharisees and crowds got to hear, that they were vipers, that they were venomous snakes. And they needed to flee from the wrath to come, and they needed to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. This is a consistent message of John the Baptist. Everybody understood this. So not only is the prophetic quote the same, but even the dialogue from Matthew is the same. Now, I'm just going to look at Mark very briefly, uh, the very first opening verses of Mark. Chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the very first page of Mark says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written by Isaiah, the prophet, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. As Isaiah 40, again, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming the message of baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a belt of leather around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. You see why they're called the synoptic gospels in a lot of ways. They're so similar in a lot of the writing. But this is one specific instance of where the message is so consistent across various writers and books of scripture that it is clear that John is significant in spite of his seeming insanity. So, what can we draw from that? We look and we see consistently that John is a man who is seriously concerned about sin, who is seriously concerned about confession and repentance, and he is a man who is seriously concerned about people's sins and transgressions against the Holy God. That is what he's chiefly concerned about. And he's making sure that they need to understand their need to humble themselves and repent before their sins and be baptized and confess. We have this wild man who lives out in the desert preaching this message consistently. How did the Jews understand that this was massive, that this was significant? And it is important that we realize this. We as uh, Western cultures and nations would uh, write this off as just total insanity on the part of somebody, some guy uh, screeching out in the wilderness, repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, but the Jews realized that something was going on. And that's important because we realize Matthew was directed largely to a Jewish audience. It was meant to be written to convince Jews how true their Old Testament was to this man Christ. But the Jews realized something about John the Baptist, and they realized that this was the prophetic motif. This was the prophetic pattern. Guys in the wilderness, understanding the law and the message of the Lord, right? This was something the Jewish people were used to. They got that. They understood something that we may necessarily not see, but is that all through the Old Testament, this was the motif and this was the pattern in a large scale of the Old Testament prophets, right? They lived or they came from or abided in or in some way... Uh, resided in the wilderness by themselves. Their prophet and wilderness are often very closely tied together. We see that just by looking at a few examples in the Old Testament. Elijah is one that suffers a period of, he suffers and lives in the desert, uh, for, especially for his time of uh, persecution. Moses, fantastic example, one who's driven from his power and fame to live in the desert, to reside in the desert, completely changes his entire course of living. Uh, um, David, I almost said Daniel. David is another example, right? He lives consistently running from Saul, lives a great deal of his life as a king and prophet, writing the Psalms, 
uh, living in caves, running for his life. And what's fascinating is if you look at the Psalms and you see so many Psalms that were written that say, and you'll see the superscription at the top of the Psalm that says, written in the wilderness or written uh, while David was in a cave hiding or running from Saul. He's not worried about Saul. He's not worried about politics. He's not worried about, oh man, I'm living in this cave. What he's thinking about in that cave is the law of the Lord. And that's fascinating. So there is some pattern, there is some uh, motif throughout scripture in which prophets were uh, living in the desert. And the Jews got that. They understood that there was something significant about someone in the desert preaching the message of God. So it also explains just historically, while uh, a good deal later, in the third and fourth centuries as time went on, that you see this kind of developing as it starts to grow into a more Roman Catholic idea. Um, as the church history continues, this idea that you should go out in the desert and kind of isolate yourself, right? That was kind of the motif of the monks and the abbots, that you need to go out and uh, pretty much live by yourself, and you'll experience God way out there somewhere. And uh, that kind of drew from this concept. But now, I'm going to get to John's actual message. The Jews understood it was significant. They realized that there is a man out in the desert, and he's not crazy, because this is how prophets work. And he has simply one command... And one promise. That's all John has to say. He offers this one command. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. That is his message. You need to repent. Repentance is critical to your survival because and for the kingdom is coming. It's nearby. Depending on your translation. The kingdom of heaven is near. Depending on more, uh, how accurate the Greek is, or the Greek translation is there. So this is a critical message of John. Right? You need to repent because something is coming, specifically the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is about to arrive, and you need to be prepared for it. It's the same message that he preaches to Pharisees and to crowds alike. We see that in Luke. There's a need for repentance and humility among the people of God before Christ arrives on the scene, before Christ is even in the picture. There's a need to understand your humility and your sinfulness. That's fantastic. And it's important that we realize that. And before we go much further, I want us to look specifically at the command today. And then we'll look at the promise next week. The command being repent. And before we look at the nature of repentance, obviously we have to define our terms. So we sit down and we say, okay, so we have to be a people that understand repentance. We as believers in Christ be, uh, claim to be a people characterized by repentance. Obviously it's something that is critical and foundational not only to our lives but to salvation. Right? It has to be something that is accompanied by salvation or in salvation. So we need to ask the question, so what is repentance? Right? How do we biblically define that term? And uh, if you go out there, you'll find a thousand definitions. And uh, the general assumption that you'll find in the larger evangelicalism is that essentially it's being sorry. I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong. It's the idea that you apologize. You say you're not going to do it again. That you, uh, you're sorry that this happened. That you feel bad for your sin. You're going to promise to do better. That's the general definition of repentance that you've out there in the world, and they're not entirely wrong by any stretch, but so that we define our terms biblically, I want us to keep reading in Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to see two specific characteristics of repentance. So in Matthew chapter 3, I'm going to read down through verse 7, so this is the statement, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they are being baptized by him in the river of the Jordan, confessing their sin." confessing their sin. That's significant. But then, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming out to his baptism, he says, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's significant. So you have two defining characteristics of repentance right off the bat in Matthew chapter 3. The people that come out the people that understand John's message, the people that are baptized, are people that confess their sins. We see that. And then we see John openly rebuke somebody because they are not demonstrating a work or a fruit that is in accordance with repentance. So here's two defining characteristics of repentance right off the bat. You look biblically at the idea here. If you look at Scripture as a whole, no one defines and examples repentance better than John the Baptist. So that is massive, massive to him, for obvious reasons. You know, if you want to look at examples of repentance and examples of uh, what it means and how it works and examples of uh, people that live like that, John the Baptist is number one. That is, his entire life is repentance. So, uh, 
we need to understand repentance. We, there's no better example we can look at than John the Baptist, except we might be able to argue for Psalm 51, which we'll look at here in a minute. Psalm 51 is that iconic Psalm of David uh, that he wrote immediately after his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, so there's a story, David's confronted about his sin that uh, he commits with Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet comes out and deliberately uh, gets in his face and uh, exposes his sin, and then you see Psalm 51, and it is an extremely emotional psalm. And that is something that we should also take into consideration. But John has two things that he looks at in terms of repentance in the book of Matthew. The first is there is a confession of sin. There's a confession of sin. We see that people that came out to be baptized by John would confess their wrongs. They would confess their sins. They would understand that there is a need for them to realize and make clear how much they have failed their God. That's a repentance. So, by extension, by that, if we claim to be a repentant people, consistently living in repentance, we need to be a people that confess our sins to God and man, if necessary. We need to be a people that are actively understanding the need for confession to God of our sins and of our failures and what we have done and understanding how wrong we are in our unrighteousness. And if we're not understanding that, we're missing a key component of repentance, confession of sin. I'm going to be clear what I'm saying when I say that. What I'm not saying is that you need to go down your verbal checklist here, and it's like a Roman Catholic idea where uh, you sit down and you say, okay, I'm going to check this. I, you know, this sin is covered. I confess this one, this one, this one, and this one. And if you don't verbally say it to your priest or whatever the case, that you're not repenting. That's not what I'm saying. It's not the case at all. But there does need to be clearly some process by which there is a realization and an open admittance of your sinfulness to God. And you realize how unrighteous we are. When it's clear that you're the one in the wrong in this regard, that's repentance. And I'll even go further and say, as Catholic as it sounds, uh, I believe that there is a lot of Scripture that makes clear that we should not only just confess our sins to God, but also to other believers in Christ. There is absolutely a need for that. James 5, chapter 5, 16 is one example. I'm going to cite here. I don't want to dwell greatly on it. But if you look at James 5, 16, it says, Confessing to one another your sins. And the idea there is uh, that you confess your sins to God and you confess them to other believers in Christ to maintain that level of transparency and humility with other believers in Christ. It's something that uh, I've been personally uh, trying to cultivate in my life because I realized um, some years ago that I was very good at uh, keeping my problems to myself and my sins and my struggles included, all in one bundle. And uh, it was made clear to me that I need to be more transparent about my sins and my failures and my struggles and the whole nine yards uh, in regards to that. So being more open and honest about what's really going on and uh, being willing to swallow my pride and admit my sins and my failures to other people has been a uh, sanctifying journey of mine that is not yet finished by any stretch. Uh, but there is great value in that. There's value in transparency with other believers as well as God as to your unrighteousness. So, that's the first definition, confession of sin. Then you have the second definition, where John says to those that have claimed some kind of repentance, those that said they were coming out to be baptized, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, he turns them away because he says, you need to bear fruit in keeping or in accordance with repentance. We just know this experientially, right? You don't even need scripture to tell you that. If um, some guy wrongs you or somebody does something to you or hurts you or wrongs you in some way, and they say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it again, and they do it again, then clearly there wasn't a whole lot of repentance, was there? Clearly it wasn't worth too much to him. So John's rebuke of the Pharisees here, uh, which we'll look at as we get further into this confrontation, but we can see that John makes clear you need to bear fruit that implies or is in somehow in accordance with your repentance, that is necessary for repentance. That's fantastic. You realize that repentance cannot just be emotional, although it absolutely is, and in a lot of cases is emotional, and Psalm 51 makes that very clear, but it is not just an emotional sorrow in our hearts. There is an actual fruit that must accompany repentance. And then, obviously, throughout Scripture, there's many an example of, um, you see all of these repentant actions that are taken, especially by individuals who may claim to turn from their ways and do not, and are therefore condemned. The repentance requires not just this idea of being sorry, not just this idea of emotional sorrow, but also this idea of action and change. You have to actually 
demonstrate some kind of action to show the repentance is real. Now, again, I want to clarify what I'm not talking about is that if you don't work somehow or you don't demonstrate some level of goodness or you don't turn from your sin, you're not going to be, have forgiveness and you're not going to go to heaven. That's not at all what the uh, uh, prophet John the Baptist is saying. This is not some kind of legalistic push. This is not saying, well, if I don't uh, perform the correct actions, then I'm not going to get repentance and I'm not going to get forgiveness. No, that's not the case at all. Uh, we know that faith precedes the works. Faith is that which is necessary to create and generate the repentance and the works in us. Uh, but even James, the whole book of James makes very clear something. Uh, the entire motif of James is that your faith, if it doesn't produce some kind of works, is dead. Right? Essentially, he states, not saying that your works must somehow precede your faith, that your works determine your faithfulness or not, but if your faith clearly does not work out some kind of work or action or change in your life, then apparently it's not very strong faith. That's what he says. Apparently is that much of a faith. That's the message of James. We even understand that. We can look back at Luke. I know I'm turning back and forth again everywhere. Uh, Luke chapter 3, 10 through 14, you'll see that demonstrated. How repentance works itself out in John the Baptist's turn. So in Luke chapter 3, verse 10, John the Baptist gets done saying the axe is laid to the root of the trees. He leaves them with this dire warning. He says there is an axe and it's sharp and it's near the root. And it's ready to start cutting. It is, the, the time is imminent. And uh, the people hear that, and they say, oh man, what are we going to do? And what John does say, and he does not say that it needs to be an emotional repentance. He doesn't say it has to be some kind of being sorry. He gives them direct actions that they take that are fruits in keeping with repentance. He says, and the crowds asked him and said, what are we going to do? Because the axe is here. And he answered them, whoever has two tunics to share is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. So, greed, selfishness, immediately, tossed out the window. You can't just hoard your stuff, he says, and be repentant. Tax collectors came to baptize and said, teacher, what are we going to do? And he says, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Don't steal. Okay? That's pretty straightforward repentance. He said to them, uh, the soldiers asked him and said, what are we going to do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anybody who, by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages, right? So, don't abuse your power. Don't use your power for selfish gain. Don't uh, be content with what you have. These are fruits that John commands are part and parcel of their repentance. If they want to escape the acts, that's at the root of the tree. So there is these actions that are implied that should be part of repentance. You know, we talked about this extensively in uh, Ephesians uh, last Wednesday. And it was uh, amazing to me how similar it was. Uh, because we looked at the putting on of the new self and the taking off of the old self and how there is this understanding in scripture of this 180 transition right one of my favorite theologians rw glenn i know i've mentioned this in ephesians but i mention it for everybody uh that this repentance has to be this 180 turning right so he looks at it this way he says repentance is much like he defines it like this if you're in the middle and uh sin's over here and god's over here and you're focused on sin then to repent, you must turn 180 degrees all the way to God. Because if you just stop here, if you just turn from the sin, and you're not seeking Christ, and not only just removing the sin, but turning back to Christ and focusing upon his word and his devotion and his love and his gospel, and seeking him passionately and with your mind and your heart, and if you just stay at the 90 degree mark, then essentially you only have two options. You're going to fall back into your sin, or you're going to become a legalist. That's all he says is going to happen. And it makes sense, right? Because if you don't fill that sinful void with that which is supposed to fill the void, it's just going to work itself back out in another way. So repentance, by definition, is not just turning from sin. It's turning back to focus upon Christ completely. Or else it's not a repentance that's going to bear fruit. One other fantastic historical example of this, and there's no better man that understands repentance better than Martin Luther. Martin Luther's whole life is defined by repentance, and his story is fascinating, because we know he's an individual who spent much of his younger life trying to find it, and he can't seem to find it because he's looking for it in legal transactions. So he spends all his life, it's the the R.C. Sproul does a fascinating study called The Insanity of Luther, that Luther could be documented as a mental disorder because he would, um, he would live in a monastery, he would live as a monk, he would scrub the floors, 
and he'd keep scrubbing the same floor over and over and over again because he couldn't get it clean in his psychological understanding. He just wouldn't stay clean like himself. He just couldn't figure out why it wasn't clean and why he could not get it clean. Like he was unable to finish the job. Uh, his father, Abbott, was just driven out of his mind because uh, he kept coming back and repenting of more sins. He would walk out of the repentance booth, uh, do something or think something a while he's stepping out of the booth and have to step back in and repent of it again driving the guy insane he's constantly looking for a way to remove his guilt and he can't figure out how to be sorry enough that's amazing and we know that and we can see that as a characteristic of his life through his most famous work the 95 Theses now it is a direction against the Catholic Church but if you look up the 95 Theses if you look up the very first thesis the very fundamental one and how they're written is they're written consecutively so he builds a slow argument uh, based on one, argues for two, argues for three, argues for four, all the way down. Oh, the very first thesis of the 95 Theses says this. Martin Luther says, When our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said to repent, in Matthew chapter 4, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. He realized it. It wasn't just a legal transaction where he goes and he confesses enough times and receives the correct amount of grace from God. Legally. It is a lifestyle. It is a way of life. It is an entire living concept. And that's the very first thesis. That's the one that's driving everything else. His upsetting, his, his being mad about indulgences and everything else that he's upset about is driven by the fact that repentance is not supposed to be a piece of paper that you sign. It's supposed to be a way of life and thinking and living. So Luther is a fantastic demonstration of that. That this is not just repentance in an action although it does require that you see john says you have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance if we claim to be repenting sincerely it's not just an emotional reaction although sorrow for sin is a very real part of repentance you see that in psalm 51 david's just completely broken up and upset about what he's done he begs god to show him mercy and forgiveness in psalm 51 there is a real sorrow for sin again what i'm not saying is that uh, we need to be crying in tears every time we're confessing sin, that we, if we're not having a you know, massive emotional outpouring, that we're not repentant enough. That's not the case. But there's a real sorrow for sin that is a part of the parcel of repentance. And it can't just be a turning away from sin without turning fully to Christ. Right? All of these are components of repentance. All of these are part of the entire lifestyle and way of life that is being a repentant believer in Christ consistent. And that's what John preaches here. It's understanding that we need to humble ourselves on a daily and hourly basis before God and realizing that we have failed and we have transgressed and we are unrighteous and we need him to show us mercy. And that's repentance. So repentance essentially says, I have failed and I am unrighteous and I need your grace, oh God, because I'm unable to produce it myself. This has to be characteristic of our lives. It's so foundational that a prophet was sent specifically for the purpose of making that clear for the coming of Christ. That repentance has to be a defining characteristic of realizing how unrighteous and how failed we are at righteousness and how we need grace and mercy. So we're going to be preaching and looking a lot of that in the coming sermons, but uh, for now I just want us to rest with the message of the command of John. We need to repent, and not just at baptism. It's not just that salvation, but it needs to be something that defines the kind of people we are, consistently. So we need to be a humble people, we need to be a hopeful people, We realize that there is grace. And we'll look at that next week. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is here. It is near by. <clears throat> but it's a lifestyle and a way of living, but it's defined by humility and grace and hope. And it's a constant submitting to God and realizing that we are not right and that he loves us anyway. So, let's be a people that command, that we, uh, the people that live the way John commands, we live. We need to be a repenting people. We need to be a repenting people because now we know the kingdom of heaven is here. John, in John's timeline, it had yet, it was nearby, but it had not transpired yet. Now we know the kingdom of heaven has arrived in the person of uh, himself, Jesus Christ. We now live through this church. So we must live lives characterized by this.
Father, we want to come before you and praise you that you're a God who forgives wretched sinners, that you're a God who looks at people who are not right, who have failed, who are not righteous people like us, and that you love us, that you sacrifice for us, and you give us grace and mercy regardless. We just pray that we would be a people that live this repentant life, not just in our confessions and not just in our prayers, but that we would live entire lives that are defined by understanding how unrighteous we are and by bearing fruit in accordance with the grace you have given us. I pray, Lord, that this would be the pattern of our lives and that we would commit this time to one another to you and that as we go out in the rest of this week and we deal with the rest of the world, that they would see us as a humble and repentant and a grace-filled 